uh, travel up here, decided to stay home, but here you are. So I'm glad to see you this morning. Uh, hey, we just, I want to welcome a couple of people that are here this morning. Uh, our pastor Stan is here this morning and uh, glad to have him here. And he's been leading our care team leaders and uh, he is available and wants to be here once a month so that uh, he can be working with them and be available for them. So really glad to have him here. And, uh, and our sister Sandy Goodrich is here. And Sandy, it's so incredible to have you back. We love you. Uh, we're glad that you're here. Uh, I'd love to open up this morning with a reading from Psalm 130. And it is a lectionary reading this morning. And I just think it is awesome. As we continue in 2 Samuel, we think about all that God has brought David through and all he brings us through. It says, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my mercy to my cry for mercy. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than a watchman waits for the morning, more than a watchman waits for the morning. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. The word of the Lord. Be to God. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for your incredible mercy. Thank you for your incredible closeness to each of us. Uh, you have indeed been with us, and we have fallen upon your mercy time and time again. And it is like a mattress and a pillow for us. Uh, it is soft and it is inviting and it is good. We thank you for your incredible goodness, Lord. And we worship you because of who you are, who you've been in our lives and who you will continue to be. We praise you. We lift up your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And we follow with your help, your Holy Spirit, who leads and guides. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, if Sue is here, she can come and lead us in worship this morning. Thank you, Sue. Good morning. Shall we stand as we start to sing? We're going to start with day by day. There's three verses, and we'll be singing all three, please. Thank you. 
Now we're going to go to 707, please. And we'll sing both verses. <laughs> through music. Good morning. I am so blessed to have Sue up here. Yes? Are you blessed? I am blessed to have Sue come up and, and lead the music. It's just amazing. Thank you, Sue. Um, when I choose my songs, I choose them prayerfully. And um, I read the message. I read what the scripture is going to be. And if you feel the presence of the Spirit flowing through you and through this place, you will meet God in every aspect, and he will meet you in every part of the songs that we sing, if there is special music, whomever it may be, and then the message, and it all ties in together. And as Pastor was reading Psalms, and David is praising the Lord throughout the Psalms, and maybe wondering and questioning. If you look back and see this little boy who was least likely to succeed, and then he becomes a shepherd. He's the youngest of how many? He's got so many brothers. Oh, my goodness. And he is counted for who knows in that family because he's the youngest and he's the littlest. What is he capable of? And then here he is coming before us as the king. I'm going to sing Holy Water, and I'm sure some of you know this song. And there's repetition. And I would so love to have you join me in the parts that you know. And the parts as you listen that you'll get to know. Thank you. God, I'm on my knees again. God, I'm begging, please again. I 
need you. Oh, I need you. Walking down these stairs and roads, water for my thirsty soul. I need you. Oh, I need you. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips, like a sound of the symphony. Like holy water on my skin Dead man walking, slave to sin I want to know about being born again how good it is to be able to walk with the Lord and to be in relationship with him and to have that security uh, and that friendship. Hey, this morning, we're going to move into a time of uh, praise reports and prayer concerns. And uh, I did want to say, uh, really glad to have Norm uh, with us this morning. And uh, he is back, went through a successful surgery and uh, with his kidney, was having some problems. And we we're praying that it wasn't cancer because he's had some history with that. And it wasn't, it was just a kink. And they put a stint in, and he is everything is is going well now. So um, good to have you back, Brother Norm, and uh, glad everything is is going so good. So we're giving praise for that. Uh, any other uh, praise reports or prayer requests or updates this morning? Oh, I do have another one actually. Randy uh, is going in for his eighth and final chemo treatment of this type. Uh, it has been this is uh, the Demont son-in-law, and it has been. Uh, it's, a, it's been an intensive chemo treatment and it has really wiped him out the last time he had landed in the hospital uh, to get rehydrated and, 
and all that. So they're really thankful that this is the last. They've asked us to pray with them uh, that when he goes in for his updates and results that the scans will come back positive and good. And he's still on a journey and he's still going through it, but we're glad that this stage is coming to an end. So, amen. Anything that you'd like to add to that, Gloria? No, he still has a long battle there, just to, it's not the end. That right. He's going to make that known that um, right. he'll have surgeries and whatnot in the future, yeah, but at least he's done with this part. Right. It's leaving him with a little neuropathy, which is what their fear was, which is the loss okay. of sense in your fing fingers and feet. Mm. Okay. Well, we are glad. We'll celebrate every, every victory, uh, but we'll continue to pray too because it is a, a long road. So, amen. Any other praise reports or prayer requests this morning that you'd like to share? Betty? Excellent. Excellent. That's a great praise report. And Betty has been away now for, God, it feels like almost a year, right? And so, so we're glad that she's able to return home and cancer-free. Betty Banks, amen. Another great praise report. We're, we're very glad. Any other praise reports or prayer concerns this morning? Yes, I see a hand back here. Yes, she Excellent. So Lily um, has um, Crohn's and had to go and have a section of her um, intestine removed, right? And then repaired. So, and how old is Lily again? She's 11 years old. And so we'll continue praying with her. We're glad that that was successful, but it's a lot to go through at 11 years old at any age. Our friend Erica Andrews just went through a similar surgery and it's a lot to go through at any age. So we'll continue praying for Lily. Any other praise reports? Vern? I'd just like to have everybody pray for our country. It's a bad state of affairs in schools, and we're going to have to try to cause it. Let's continue interceding for, for our country. Let's continue interceding and being the church. You know, it begins with us. So we've got to be reconcilers and mediators and uh, people who see uh, the good and hope and are believing in Christ's redemption uh, because there's a lot of pessimism out there today and, and a whole lot going on, a lot of division. Uh, we don't want to be a part of that. We want to be a part of the solution, not the problem. So let's be praying forward. Amen. Any other praise reports or prayer concerns? Gloria. Okay. Somebody there who specializes in this particular disease. Right now, it looks like a year long chemo treatment. He's just two. So, Shai is just two years old and is looking at the potential of a year long chemo treatment. We're going to be praying uh, for wisdom and discernment for the best way forward. And then, so we'll be praying with you for sure. Any other prayer concerns or praise reports this morning? All right, let's go to the Lord. Uh, Father, we give you thanks. Thanks for the incredible praise reports. Uh, Lord, it's always good to hear back uh, that things have gone well and are improving. And so we give thanks for Norm and for him to be able to be here this morning after a surgery earlier this week and uh, for the prognosis to be so good. We give thanks for uh, Betty Banks, who's gone through a long uh, time of chemo and to be reported cancer-free and returning home uh, it's just incredible good news. Uh, we also lift up our brother Randy, and we just pray for him. We're thankful that this will be the last chemo treatment. We pray that he comes through better than anticipated. And uh, we also know that he has a long journey and other treatments and surgeries that will have to be yet in the future. And so we continue praying over him and the whole family. Uh, we thank you for the incredible light of faith that they have, uh, for the witness, for the testimony, but we know that uh, their faith sustains them, but it's not easy. And so we pray for continued strength 
And we pray for uh, continued wisdom and discernment on this road. We lift up Shai as well and his family, his parents in particular, as they seek a second opinion for knowing the best way to move forward with treatment. Uh, we pray for healing and for restoration in Jesus' name. May you strengthen his body. May you make it whole. And uh, may you give him a life and a future uh, that is unhindered. And we pray over him that he would be yours. He belongs to you. And that you will raise him up to do great things uh, for the sake of your kingdom. In Jesus' name. Uh, Lord, we lift up Lily. And we thank you for a successful surgery. Uh, but our hearts ache at all that she has to go through at this young age. And so we continue to pray over her for healing and for restoration as well. Uh, we pray incredible wisdom for this young girl, uh, that she might know that she is yours and that she might know how to walk through life in the midst of this. Give her parents wisdom as well and surround the whole family with your love and your care and give victories, and we let us celebrate each of those victories in Jesus' name. Uh, Lord, we intercede on behalf of our nation, and first we, we pray for grace. We pray for forgiveness for ourselves, for the ways that we get caught up uh, in the divisiveness, and we pray that you would help us to be mediators and to reach across the table. We pray that we might actually sit at the table with those who think and are different than us, who see different, who hear different, and from one another's stories, we might all grow in wisdom and understanding, uh, that we might accept our differences and that we might find our commonalities. Uh, we pray that you make us one nation in you again. And we pray that as in the past, you help us to work through our differences so that we come out of this stronger. We pray for our schools and for our kids uh, in those schools. Uh, may you bring protection for them and may you give them wisdom and discernment as they grow up to be the next generation of leaders. Uh, may we even learn from them, as the scripture says, that a child shall lead them. So may we hear their voices as well and believe that they have something to contribute uh, and that you are constantly pouring new wine into new wineskins. Uh, so help us to learn and to move forward. Uh, Lord, we want to be your people. So by the power of your Holy Spirit at work within us, give us eyes and ears to see and hear. And may the change that we seek begin within ourselves. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. All right. At this time, our kids are dismissed to Sunday school uh, with Miss Renee this morning. And for those that are staying here, uh, why don't you go ahead and take your Bibles and open to the book of 2 Samuel chapter 5. 2 Samuel chapter 5, as we continue our journey, we have completed 1 Samuel, and last week we began 2 Samuel. David has been made king in Judah, and uh, we're going to be picking up from that point this morning and see some of the changes that have gone on in the meantime. The title of the message is God's Slow Work. God's slow work. You know, they say good things come to those who wait. And of course, we have learned by experience that indeed the best things in life develop over time, whether it's a fine wine or wisdom and understanding or friendship. Or I think uh, particularly of the birth of a child, nine months in the womb, growing and forming and coming together in time. I, I found out some new information uh, recently that blew my mind. Did you know that elephants, uh, that they are pregnant for 18 to 22 months? Can you imagine? I mean, I can't even imagine being pregnant. I'm glad to be born the gender I was. Nine months would be too long. 18 to 22 months? Oh, my word. There are things that take time. I think of the New Testament and one of the major projects that was going on in the time of Jesus 
uh, that the disciples were just very wowed about, and it took a long time. This was the renovation of the temple in Jerusalem, not the building of the temple. The renovation of the temple took 46 years to come about. Susan Gale says, the longer you have to wait for something, the more you will appreciate it when it finally arrives. The harder you have to fight for something, the more priceless it will become once you achieve it. And the more pain you have to endure on your journey, the sweeter the arrival at your destination. All good things are worth waiting for and worth fighting for. James Houston connects this to our spiritual development and he reminds us and says, spiritual formation is the slowest of all human movements. Spiritual formation is the slowest of all human movements. In First and Second Samuel, what we're seeing is the slow development of Israel's formation as a people. We began with Abraham uh, in 2100 BC. That's Israel's story, that he's the father of Israel, but it will be his grandson who has his great-grandchildren who become the 12 tribes. 2100 BC, the Exodus happens in 1400 BC. So hundreds of years pass before that promise to Abraham comes to fruition and he sees his children and grandchildren and his descendants like stars in the sky heading toward the promised land. And then we have a period of the judges that we had come to an end of in 1 Samuel, 350 years. And then finally, the anointing of the first king of Israel in the year 1040 BC, Saul. The whole Bible is focused on the formation of a people, beginning with Israel, but ultimately spreading to humanity. Spiritual formation is a long, slow process. But apparently it's something that God thinks is worth taking time with. Samuel anointed David as king of Israel. Fifteen years mixed with hardship and uncertainty pass before David is finally anointed as king over Judah, the southern part of Israel. So Saul, the first king, has now died, and David has been anointed king of Judah. And he, we saw last week, extends a gentle hand to the north, which tends to be known as Israel, and later during the time of the divided kingdom will become Israel to the north and Judah officially in the south. And he says, he invites them to move forward with him in God's plan. Now, it seems like that should have been the moment when everything came together. But chapters two through four tell us of the long trial now. Israel, the north, didn't accept that gentle invitation. Instead, uh, they continue resisting God's will. And so chapters two through four, are seven years of hardship and civil war between the north and the south, Israel and Judah. Chapter five finally introduces us to a united Israel under God's chosen king. Let's go ahead and read 2 Samuel chapter five, verses one through 10. All the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. And the Lord said to you, You will be shepherd. You will shepherd my people Israel, and you will become their ruler. When all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, the king made a compact with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. The king and his men marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites who lived there. The Jebusites said to David, you will not get in here. Even the blind and the lame can ward you off. They thought David cannot get in here. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress on Zion, of Zion, the city of David. On that day, David said, 
Anyone who conquers the Jebusites will have to use the water shaft to reach those lame and blind who are David's enemies. That is why they say the blind and the lame will not enter the palace. David then took up residence in the fortress and called it the city of David. He built up the area around it from the supporting terraces inward, and he became more and more powerful because the Lord God Almighty was with him. The word of the Lord. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing in the book of 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, uh, a theme, is that we learn the hard way. We learn the hard way. Don Williams Jr. tells us it's not such a bad thing. He says, lessons that come easy are not lessons at all. They are gracious acts of luck. Yet lessons learned the hard way are lessons never forgotten. You know, the story of Adam and Eve is the story of humanity choosing to learn the hard way. And guess what? It's our story. Have you noticed over the course of your life that this is the hard way? I mean, life is good. There are a lot of blessings, but man, there's a lot of hard, isn't there? We're continuing that story. We're learning the hard way. After seven years of civil war, the elders of the northern tribes come to David and they share memories of the good old days. You remember the good old days, right? They're like, remember the good old days, David, when you led our military? And then in verse two, they remind him of God's promise. And the Lord said to you, you will shepherd my people Israel and you will become their ruler. Do you see what just happened there? Right? After years of working with Saul to murder David, after seven more years after Saul died of setting up other kings rather than David, they come to David and they say, what's all this fighting for anyway? Remember when you led our military? They're the best victories we ever had. The greatest success we ever had. And don't you recall God's promise that you would be our king? As if David needed reminding. Verse 2 confirms that they knew Samuel's prophecy. And they did everything they could to do it their own way anyway. Oh, friends, welcome to our shared human experience. Just last week, one of our congregation members told me after, uh, before service, she was speaking of her youngest, and she said, you know, he's the kind of kid that just has to touch the hot stove. And I smiled because, you know, that's, that's humanity, isn't it? That's our common predicament. We just have to touch the hot stove to figure it out for ourselves. And you know what? God allows us to learn the hard way. And sometimes learning this way creates years of hardship. But we can't say that those years were unnecessary or unfruitful. Because apparently it took those years of hitting our heads against the wall again and again to finally come to the point where we said, maybe God's way is better. Maybe I'll try it that way. Hmm? Anyone share that experience? When I was a kid, I was always worried that God was going to punish me for doing something wrong because I went to that church, right? Uh, every Sunday was a message about hellfire and brimstone and where sinners go. And then at the very end, but thank God for Jesus. <laughs> Seven years old, I'm like shivering in my pew. <laughs> a lot of people are worried God is going to punish them. And some of us are waiting around hoping God will punish some of them. <laughs> right? But as I've grown in the faith and as I've come to understand the gospel and the New Testament message more and more, I've become convinced that God isn't doling out punishments anymore. In fact, there's a verse in the New Testament that it's actually from the Old Testament but isn't understood until after Jesus' death and resurrection. It comes from Isaiah 53. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. 
We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, I I believe that what we sometimes think are punishments are really just natural consequences. So when we ask, why did this have to happen? It's usually tied to natural consequences, oftentimes our decisions or the choices of someone else, but natural consequences. It makes sense that humans used to attribute natural phenomena to the gods because they didn't understand what made the earth quake or a volcano erupt or a plague spread. They didn't understand what made the sun darken from time to time or hail to fall and destroy their crops. But, you know, eventually they figured out that there was a connection between human waste and their drinking water. And they realized when they dumped their human waste into their drinking water, that terrible sickness occurred. And when they stopped doing that, when they figured it out, that there was this connection, there was this natural consequence, and they separated these two things, things got better, problems got solved. It wasn't the gods, after all, who were punishing them. Why did a condominium complex collapse in Miami? It wasn't because of God's righteous judgment. There was, according to the report three years ago, major structural damage. That a concrete slab in the pool area had been compromised significantly. That there had been abundant cracking and crumbling of columns and beams and walls in the parking garage under the building. And the recommendation was, this needs to be fixed immediately. Most of what we suffer is due to natural consequences. Why? Well, because we tend to learn the hard way. But the good news is, is God is patient with us. In the next part of the passage, it's all about David taking possession of Jerusalem. You know, for a long time, I never thought about Jerusalem existing before Israel. Like I just always imagined it as a city that David established, but actually it was there for a long time. It has a long history. It's not a city that David built. In fact, during the original conquest of Canaan by the Israelites some 350 years earlier under Joshua, Joshua could not subdue this city. It was inhabited by a people called the Jebusites. They're part of the ancient Canaanites the people that originally inhabited the land before Israel got there. And did you know that in the story of Abraham's sojourn, he assists five kings in this region. One of them is not only a king, but he's a priest. And guess what city he rules over? A city called Salem, which is Jerusalem. His name is Melchizedek. And this is incredibly interesting. Because this Melchizedek is called a priest of the Most High God. This is before Israel. This is before priesthood. Abraham himself has been walking with God in the land of Ur in Mesopotamia, and we don't know how he came to know of this Most High God, but apparently there's another person who's also a priest of the Most High God. And in Genesis 14, 18 to 20, it describes in this way. It says, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. That's interesting. That's important to us as Christians, as symbols. He was priest of God most high, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Congratulations, that's where tithing came from. (laughs) Now, this Melchizedek is an important figure. He's a mysterious priest who serves the Most High God before Israel ever is even a nation. And he lives and rules over a place called Salem, which is Jerusalem. A thousand years before David's time, 
before Israel existed, before the priesthood, God had a history here in this city. Isn't that fascinating? A thousand years later, God Most High is being worshipped here again. And Melchizedek is also interesting because it says that the Messiah will be a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So he becomes a type for the Christ Jesus who is to come. David, as far as he's concerned, chooses Jerusalem for its strategic position. Go ahead to the next slide. So here's a map of Israel. We see the northern part, Israel, and the southern part, Judah. And there is a road running east to west from Jericho, and it goes all the way to the coastal plain. Go ahead to hit the next. So here's a major road, and here's another route running north to south. It's called the Patriarch's Highway. You can still see it in Jerusalem today. And this is called the Patriarch's Highway because the patriarchs, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, traveled this highway often back and forth from Beit Shan, that's where Saul died, we saw the other week, all the way down to Beersheba in the south. So there are trade routes here, and it's an easy place to get. So coming through Jerusalem, you can get east and west, north and south, no problem. But the real reason why David chooses this is because look where Jerusalem lies. Do you see that border between Judah and Israel? It's a city that's not associated with either Israel in the north or Judah in the south, and it sits centrally on the border. And if you want to unite these two sections, then you choose a city that is not associated with either and make it associated with both right on the border. He's there for both of them right in between. An incredible plan. In addition, he also likes the fact that this city is already well built and it has 10 foot thick walls. This is why Joshua couldn't subdue the city. So this is ancient Jerusalem, the time of David and the Jebusites and these incredible walls are going around and so it is well built up. This is why the Jebusites boast in our passage today that the lame and the deaf could protect this city. You aren't getting in, David. And indeed, in the past, Joshua wasn't able to get in. But David uses his head, and he realizes he's not going to storm those walls, and he finds a way in through a water shaft, and they open the gate, which is a much easier way to get into a city, by opening the gate. And he indeed takes the city. And I know it says, the lame and the blind will not enter the palace, uh, but this is figurative. He has nothing against the lame and the blind, and pretty soon we're going to see that Meshiboseph, who is lame, will enter the palace and eat at the table. Now, under Solomon, the city is going to expand to the Temple Mount. So you see that uh, space up there? That's where the temple is going to be, on that high place. And then eventually the city will spread to the entire surrounding area. So by the first century, uh, Jerusalem this is what you're seeing in the time of Jesus and just shortly after. And then uh, this part right here is the original Jebusite city of David. So this is the expansion. Here is Herod's palace. And then this northern part is expanding during the time of Jesus. And after him, a wall is set up. And so here we see this incredible expansion that happens over time. Now I want you to know on this next slide that we first saw, uh, a step structure. It is right here. You can hardly see it, but what it is is a retaining wall, a giant retaining wall going up, and it fortifies or supports the fortress that is here. This is called uh, the Jebusite's fortress, and David will turn this into his palace. And this is why he can see Beersheba. Do you notice it's all on a downward slope? He's at the highest point. He can see everything that's going on in the city downward. Now, go ahead to the next slide. You can actually visit this stone structure, the step slope today in Jerusalem. They've uncovered it. This is a picture that I was fortunate enough to be able to take myself. And I can imagine how many kids used to climb this because this is where I would be. I'd be climbing up and down that slope all the time. Go to the next slide. And this is what it would have looked like. So here's this supporting retaining wall to support this side. And then this is looking out that way over the city. 
fortress of Zion that David overtakes and makes and renovates to turn into his palace. Now, when I think about the time between Melchizedek Salem, a thousand years before David, and then finally David's Jerusalem, and when I look at how long it took between the time that God told Saul, I reject you as king over Israel, and the time that David is actually made God's chosen king over Israel, we are reminded of God's slow but steady work. We see how patient God is with humanity, with us, with me, and with you. 2 Peter 3, 8 to 10 reminds us, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. I look back uh, on the, a younger me when I was about 20 years old and I had moved to Grand Rapids and I was part of a Pentecostal church over on 44th Street, uh, now known as First. Uh, back then it was uh, the First Assembly of God. And we were having this big revival. And there was other revivals going on. There was one in Pensacola, Florida. There was one in Toronto, Canada. Big deals. If you were charismatic back then, you know all about it. And I was excited because I was feeling a call on my life. And I just saw God. I just believed that he was going to do this major sweep that the whole nation was going to come back to him. And I was excited to see God turn the world upside down and what he was going to do, or maybe I should say right side up. And the revivals were good, and they definitely worked a fruit in my life, uh, but it didn't turn the nation right side up. Not everyone came back. It wasn't a major revival where the whole country came back. And I realized as the years went by and over time that somewhere along my journey, God had introduced me uh, to his slow, sometimes seemingly invisible work. And I have found in my life and in ministry that oftentimes it's a matter of trust that God is working in ways that I cannot see. You know, I believe that our God is a big picture God. We tend to get caught up in the small details and it's not like God's not there, he's in it all, but he's a big picture God. God is shaping and forming in our entire lives for eternity. And he's mostly concerned with the ultimate outcomes. And he invites us to take the long view. And to the work that he invites us to is to focus on the redemption of humanity. And of course, that redemption begins in our own lives. I forget who said it, but it's a great quote. He said, everyone thinks of changing the world, but nobody thinks of changing themselves. We are involved in the redemption of humanity and it begins with ourselves. This is our life's work. And we remember what we said at the beginning, spiritual formation is the slowest of all human movements. I no longer have to ask why. Instead, I'm invited to trust. And when I don't see and I don't understand something that's going on, I'm still invited to trust. I, to trust in the larger work of God, which is often invisible to the human eye. Because as the saying go, goes, it's hard to see the forest through the trees. Most often, the small details, the little things that go wrong, are a result of someone's decision or action, ours or someone else's. But the good news is, is that God is able to redeem even our broken choices. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Oftentimes, I, I think, when I think of this verse, I think of Joshua. And I think of how his brothers sold him into slavery. And... Later on, years later, they come to Egypt 
And after much hardship and after much difficulty, having spent time in prison, having spent time as a slave, eventually he rises up to become unexpected to anyone, including himself, the second in charge over Egypt under only Pharaoh himself. And his brothers come to Egypt because there's a famine in the land and they're the ones who had sold him into slavery. And so they're really surprised to not only find him alive, but troubled to find him as ruler in Egypt. But he forgives them. And he says to them, you meant it for evil, but God used it for good. You know, in this instant culture of ours, it's a spiritual practice to choose to take something, take on something that's going to take some time and some dedication to fulfill. So I encourage you, as we come to the conclusion of this message, I encourage you to apply this message by taking on something that's going to be the long haul, something that's going to take time to complete a project or a goal that's going to take consistency to fulfill. Maybe it's a hobby, a hobby where you're going to have to learn about something. I like to collect coins. I started doing that a few years ago, and I'm learning so much, but I learn more and more with time. And my collection grows little by little with time. Take on something that you're interested in, you want to learn about. Maybe you're going to take on a study. Study something that might take a few years to get proficient in. Something that interests you, but will also take dedication and commitment for the long haul. Uh, Maybe it's you're being invited to something, uh, physical fitness. Maybe take on something that is going to take consistency and that there's going to be Gains and sometimes there'll be setbacks, but over time, you'll see results. Maybe it's like physical therapy. I think of our brother Vern, who's been in physical therapy for that left side of his. And this consistency that it takes in order to get that movement back into his left side. But he's been doing it diligently and he sees progress, but some days like this morning, there's a little bit of setback but he'll keep going to work so he can get that movement back and increase, and it's a long journey. Maybe take on a project. I love uh, checking in with Misha and Bear on Sunday morning because they always have projects going on at their place, sheds or uh, for motorcycles or for workshops, and they update me on what the latest thing is, and it's been a long project, a long haul, and yeah, I can see the delight as they see it come together little by little. And the reason why I encourage you to do that is because it is a spiritual practice. As you do this, as you take on something that takes time and discipline and you grow in, I want you to think about your spiritual formation and how this is the reality of what God is doing in your life. And you've been called to be a co-laborer with God in your formation into Christ's likeness. I always say I believe every Christian should know some area of their life God is working on developing right now. Thanks, Bear. Amen. <laughs> I believe we should all be attentive enough to know some area of our life that we feel like God is growing and developing right now. But know that there's no magic. It's the slow steady work of God in us over time. So if there's setbacks, okay, there's setbacks. Come back to it, return to it, and little by little, over time, you'll see growth and increase. And it might be like watching a child grow up before your eyes. You don't really notice the growth and increase until you look back at the pictures, right? This is how God works. And we're called to work with him. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for the testimony of your word as we witness the life of David and the life of Israel, as we make the connections from Melchizedek to Jesus to 2,000 years later to our time in our lives here and now. We thank you for your slow but steady and sure work. And Holy Spirit, our desire is to work with you as you lead and guide in our formation. So Spirit, I pray that you would give each person here either a new project or a project to return to. And that as their hands and their feet set about these tasks, 
you might apply it to our spiritual formation and show us where and how you're at work in our lives, that we might work with you on becoming more like Christ. We know that it's more than a lifetime worth of work. So let us begin, let us continue, and let us believe that the work that you've begun within us, you will be faithful to bring on to completion. And on that day when we see him, we'll know, we'll understand, and we'll be completely transformed to be like him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Sue, if you would come up and lead us in our song of response. Be still my soul. We'll be singing verses one and two, please. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Pam, on piano. And may you remain standing for the benediction. Uh, and also, I remind you, Pastor Stan is here, uh, especially for our care team leaders. Uh, if you want to check in with Pastor Stan, let him know how your care groups are coming along as we begin to develop them. If you're interested in joining a care group, uh, there are slips in the back on the welcome table, the white table, and you can create your own group of people that you want to meet with. I'm recommending three to six people uh, that meet once a month for 30 minutes just to check in and ask two questions. What's something going on in your life right now? And what is something that we can be praying for you for in between this meeting and the next? Uh, that way we're just finding ways for the church to be the church and get more involved and lift each other up and encourage each other in the faith. Uh, may you receive the benediction. Uh, Lord, I thank you for your people and for all the stories and the history that is represented here. Uh, you have walked with each one from the time that they were formed in the womb uh, throughout their forming in life. And you will be with us on that day when we see Christ face to face. And in the meantime, we pray that we might be about your work, that we might put our hands to pleasurable things and projects that also remind us of the work that you're doing in us, the slow and steady work of formation into Christ-likeness, and that we might give each other grace as those around us are on their journey of formation until we all safely arrive in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. God's people said, Amen. Amen. Grace and peace to you. Join us for fellowship.